So before we get into grammar of graphics, let's think about what graphics looks like without grammar. And whether you use R or you use other packages or languages to uh, generate plots, we normally do this by using specialized functions uh, such as you know box plot, histogram, scatter plot, etc., where the type of plot or the name of the plot is how we think of you know what it is that we want to show. So, as a quick example, if you were not using ggplot and you were trying to show a distribution of a quantitative variable using a histogram or a density plot, even though those two plots serve the same purpose or a very similar purpose, they actually have quite a different syntax. And so not only do you have to keep track of what it is that you want to show, you also have to keep track of how it is that you can generate that plot. Um, and it might be very different depending on the plot, even though you want to communicate pretty much an identical message with one of the two plots. So Grammar of Graphics is this book that was written by Leland Wilkinson that lays out um, a way of organizing graphical concepts through grammar. So if you think of you know the English language and you think of a sentence, a sentence is a way to communicate a message. And the noun, the subject, the verb are just different concepts that we use to be able to help communicate uh, the purpose of a sentence to someone who's listening to us. And similar, similarly, Leland Wilkinson argues that you can consider graphs in a similar way, where there's just different components to the graph that when you add them all up, help you communicate a message uh, through a final graph. And the components of a graph include data, which has variables that may be quantitative, ordinal, or categorical, through geometric objects, which include things like points, lines, histograms, or box plots, through mapping of variables, so, for example, you know, if you say show age on the x-axis and then uh, make a bar plot and color the bar based on insurance type, you're mapping age to the x-axis and you're mapping color uh, to the variable insurance type. And so by being able to map pieces of your data or variables in your data to geometric objects, you're able to, you know, uh, communicate in a language that's very clear what it is that you're, uh, you know, you want the plot to do. And finally, you know, you can label the plot. And so the title and the axes are examples of labels and facets is a way of showing uh, an analysis stratified by a variable. So for example, if I wanted to look at the relationship between age and insurance type separately for men and women, I wouldn't want to necessarily have to generate two separate plots for men and women. I want to be able to just say, you know, separate these plots by men and women. Uh, so give me a faceted plot where the faceting is happening by the sex variable such that I get separate plots back for men and women that are side by side. So just to refresh, what Leland Wilkinson was saying was that if you add up data, geometric objects, mappings, labels and facets, you end up with a plot. ggplot actually takes inspiration from that and just builds on it a little bit more. So in ggplot, you start with data, you add geometric objects, you add mappings, you can optionally tell it uh, how to position certain objects, you can add labels, you can add facets, and then you can add a coordinate system and uh, scales and themes. And so a coordinate system might be, you know, like a polar coordinate system in a pie chart versus a Cartesian coordinate system for a bar chart. Um, because you're not actually changing any of the data, you're just changing the coordinate system on which that data is being shown to the viewer. Scales uh, include things like color scales um, or can you know, include the actual X and Y axes. And then theme has to do with appearance of a plot. So do you want it to look a specific way, uh, which has nothing to do with the data or the underlying, uh, you know, relationships being shown, but just the overall appearance. And if you add these things together, you get a ggplot. 
So you might be thinking, oh my goodness, I don't want to add all these things together. All I want is a scatter plot. Why do I need to deal with all this kind of complexity? So one, one nice thing is that you know ggplot will actually generate all those components automatically. And so all you have to do is really specify the things that you need. And we'll, I'll show this through some examples. So I've been referring to the package as ggplot, but technically the package name is actually ggplot2. This package was developed by Hadley Wickham uh, and the folks at RStudio. And the GG in ggplot2 stands for Grammar of Graphics, where it gets its inspiration. So ggplot2 is the name of the package, and it's part of Tidyverse, so you don't need to library it in. As long as you've libraried in Tidyverse, you get ggplot2 libraried in automatically. And the function to actually uh, make a ggplot is ggplot without the two. So this is why I refer to both the package and the function as ggplot, but just recognize there's this slight difference uh, where the package is actually called ggplot2. The, the package also has another function called qplot. So if you look up examples of ggplot, you might see examples where people uh, invoke the qplot function. This function serves as a set of shortcut to commonly use plots, but it's a little bit less powerful because uh, it's easier to learn a specific type of plot, plot but, make, but a little bit harder to learn how to make more complex plots. So we're going to stick with using the ggplot function rather than the qplot function. And just remember that in order to use ggplot, or before you even get into using ggplot, you want to make sure that your data is tidy. And tidy data is basically where each variable has its own column, each observation has its own row, and each value has its own cell. And if any of these you know, uh, statements are violated or are not true in your data, then you've got to first tidy up your data before you run the data through ggplot. And remember that we learned uh, all of these different ways of tidying and reshaping our data. So if this is something that you know, you're feeling that you're weak on or you need further uh, explanation on, feel free to keep watching this lecture, but realize that you'll probably need to come back to those functions so that you can tidy up your data before you actually get into plotting it. So let's define the components of a ggplot in a bit more detail. When you invoke the ggplot function, all of the components of a ggplot are automatically created. So even though we said that a ggplot is a combination of all of those different components, you don't always have to add those components into a ggplot or to explicitly name those components. When you add the components together, the components are either added or they're replaced. And what I mean by that is, let's say you add a series of points to the screen, which is a type of geometric object. When you add on a geometric object of points, those points get added to the graph. However, let's say that you want to reverse the x-axis. So you add a scale that specifies a reversed scale for x-axis. This won't add that scale on top of the existing scale. It'll actually just replace the existing scale with a new scale. It might help to see this in the form of a few examples. So let's say I start with the patient's data frame. I add a ggplot, and then I add a geom point, which is a type of geometric object that generates points. And inside of that geom point object, I add this AES function, which is a which stands for aesthetic. The AES function basically means that anything inside of it specifies a mapping from aesthetics to variables. So I'm mapping the weight to the x-axis and the systolic blood pressure to the y-axis. So if I use this to generate a ggplot, the way I'm going to read this is start with the patient's data frame, then make a ggplot, then add points, and map the x-axis to weight and the y-axis to SBP. And if I do that, I'll get the following scatter plot. So just note again, 
as a point of emphasis that I need to use the AES function to specify the mapping. And the AES function, I almost think of it like this game of Simon Says. So if you include AES, then the mappings will work correctly. If you forget to write AES, which I guarantee at some point in your learning ggplot, you'll forget to write AES. Um, it's just like Simon says, if, you did, if Simon didn't say it, it's not gonna happen. And so when you expect to see X map to weight and Y map to SBP, but you wrote those lines of, you know, outside of the AES function or without an AES function, you won't get what you expect. And anytime you don't get what you expect, first confirm that you did your mappings correctly. One other thing to note here is that after patients, I'm using a pipe, but between components of a ggplot, I'm using a plus sign. So that's another mistake that you're likely to make at some point where you either use a pipe after ggplot or you use a plus after the data frame. Um, and all the pipe is doing is inserting patients into the first argument of ggplot, which is a data frame. So when you look at examples online of ggplot, you'll often see the data frame inserted as the first argument of ggplot. But I like to pipe it in uh, because that way I can modify my patient's data frame before I invoke the ggplot. Let's, look at, let's take a look at this example. So it starts off the same. I'm starting with the patient's data frame. I am making a ggplot. I'm adding on this uh, points where I've done the mapping instead of the AE, inside of the AES function where weight is mapped to X and systolic blood pressure is mapped to Y. And then I'm adding scale X reverse. And if you look at your RStudio data visualization cheat sheet and look under scales, you'll see that this is one of the options I have um, to be able to reverse the scale of the X axis. So it reads very similarly that I'm gonna start with the patient's data frame, make a ggplot, add points, do my mapping, reverse the X scale, uh, such that it goes from highest to lowest weight. And I effectively get a very similar plot to what I had on the last slide, except that weight now goes from highest to lowest, as opposed to the other way around. Another example is where we start with patients. We add ggplot, or we uh, pipe it to ggplot. We add points, we add a smooth line and now we want to take a look at which plot we're going to get. Notice that inside of geom point and inside of geom smooth, which is a way to get a smooth line, I had to specify a mapping. Because any geometric object won't work or won't know what to do unless it knows what the mapping is uh, for the aesthetics to your variables. So the way I would read this is start with the ggplot using the patient's data frame. Um, add points, map the variables, add a smooth line, map the variables. And, you know, this point I already mentioned that every object needs to know which variables to map to which aesthetics. And I would get this plot on the right. Now, it seems a little bit inefficient to have to do the mappings over and over for every geometric object. So the way I typically handle this is instead of putting the the mappings inside of the geometric objects, you can also put them inside of the ggplot function itself. So the next example shows that if I start with patients, then add a ggplot where I have the mappings inside of it, including the AES function, once I've specified the mappings, I don't have to respecify them again. So I can just add geom point and add geom smooth, and this will effectively give me the same exact uh, plot I had on the last slide. So if all geometric objects use the same mapping, you can define the mapping in the ggplot function itself, and then you don't have to specify it again unless you want to use a different mapping. And if you do want to use a different mapping, you can override the aesthetic that you already specified in the ggplot function by having a separate AES function with a new set of mappings inside the geometric object itself. So let's take a look at this example. We start with patients, then add a ggplot where 
we specify the mapping of x to weight and y to systolic blood pressure. We add a G on point, and then we specify a size here of 1 over 20. And then we add a smooth line. So what's happening here? Why is size not inside of AES? What's happening here is that First of all, the normal size is 1. And if we specify size, which was one of the valid uh, aesthetics, to a fixed value of 1 over 20, it's actually shrinking the size of all of the points, not just you know, mapping size to another variable. For example, let's say household income. So if an aesthetic like the size of a point shouldn't be mapped to a variable, but instead, you want to uniformly apply that aesthetic to all the points, then don't put that you know, mapping, or don't put that variable uh, inside of the AES function. So in this case, we left size outside of the AES function because we wanted to apply uniformly to all the points. And had we actually mapped size to a variable like household income, uh, what this would have looked like is, depending on how much money is made in the household, that would determine whether the points are large or small. And so there would be certain points that are larger, indicating that you know those are the individuals with a higher household income. And there would be other points that are smaller, indicating that those individuals have a lower household income. In layman's terms, or in kind of visualization terms, that type of plot is often referred to as a bubble chart. But realize that all that means from a ggplot perspective is the difference between mapping size to a variable versus defining size uh, as being uniform across all the different uh, points. If we map it, it's called a bubble chart. If we don't, it's called a scatter plot. Functionally, they're the same thing. Um, it's just a mapping that changed.